Hey, welcome back to Tech Tips. I'm your host, Max. And, well, not that that matters. I want to talk about uh, a principle that is the title of this video. Now, some of you will actually know what that means right away. It's, it's actually an acronym for a, an expression. And some of you will understand it and know what it means and totally get it. And for those of you that, well, just follow along anyhow. We've got lots to talk about on that subject. For those of you that don't understand what that means, don't worry. Just stick with me here. I'll explain it as we go. Well, in a minute or two or something. Anyhow, uh, this video is based largely on some comments made on a recent video that I did. And uh, I, I think they were actually meant to be kind of negative in a way, but... The uh, fact is, they were 100% true, all of them, actually. Uh, the one, no, I think, yeah, yeah, all of them were meant to be kind of a negative in a way. Uh, oh, well, it is what it is. And, uh, but it's all about the simplicity of things, which is, well, that was one of the comments. Somebody says, well, you like simple things. Yes, I do. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because I think things have become overly complex. Uh, to the point of the real pain. And I'm going to elaborate on that a bit, too. Uh, another one of the comments that was made is, uh, well, well, you specialize. Yes, I do. That is a fact. I specialize. I work primarily, exclusively, on vehicles that do not have computers. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to get to that. But uh, specializing, well... Some people kind of seem to think it makes you less of a mechanic because you specialize. No, I've done all kinds of stuff and I've kind of decided this is what I want to do. And there's nothing wrong with specializing. Lots of people specialize. And you can go to a lot of shops that are specialty shops. There's shops that do nothing but exhaust system, tires and brakes, uh, front ends, uh, well, all sorts of stuff. There's, there's just lots of shops that specialize and there's a good reason for it and in many cases it's an economic one uh, for example a machine shop that builds engines uh, that's what they do they machine blocks like this one and turn cranks like the one behind me and well these are all parts that are going in this engine so they're not part of the video so it doesn't matter uh, but it costs, even if you buy the equipment used to get decent equipment to do the job, all the boring and line honing and everything else that is necessary to do, um, even used equipment is going to cost you several hundred thousand dollars. Um, brand new equipment, I'm sure, is going to run in the millions. That's why they specialize. Uh, for a, a, the average Joe, a single person, or even a two-man shop or a three-man shop, something like that, uh, that type of equipment you would never ever pay for. You couldn't turn over enough product in order to pay for the equipment, which is why people specialize. They'll do just one thing, they'll do it well, because even when it comes to things like uh, doing a block, there's lots to know. There's a lot of measurements to be taken inside of the block. So, you know, it's just specializing is not a, that, that's not a negative thing in any way. That's uh, there's lots of shops out there that specialize. There are general mechanics, and they will do everything up to and including changing your engine, but they're general. They don't rebuild an engine. Uh, here we build engines, but we don't do the machine work because, hey, quite frankly, the shop isn't big enough for all the machines needed, and we just couldn't possibly do enough engines to justify the cost of the machines. I mean, there's lots of machines that I'd like to see in here that we just don't have. We don't have room for. The shop's not that big. And a bigger shop would cost a lot of money. And that's one of the reasons that people specialize in things is you only got room for so much equipment. And even if it's something like a muffler shop that does nothing but exhaust systems, you might think that's not very high tech. But you got to realize uh, to be very good with a pipe bender, it actually takes a fair bit of skill, and I respect the guys that do a really good installation on an exhaust system because, honestly, I don't think I could do it. Does that mean I'm not a good mechanic, though? Hmm, I don't think so. It just means I know my limitations, and I don't do it enough to get good at it because, like anything, 
you got to do a lot of it to get good at it. Doesn't matter what it is. So um, I specialize. Yes, I specialize. I work on vintage vehicles because, well, a lot of people don't even understand how they work, and I find them to be real easy to work on. But uh, carburetors and drum brakes and stuff like that. There's lots of guys out there that are they're good mechanics, but you know because of their age, uh, that stuff is totally foreign to them because. Uh, they haven't sold new cars with carburetors since back in the 1980s. So it's uh, kind of a lost art. Uh, I happen to be old enough that I understand those things. I've worked on them and I actually I still own one too. And uh, I love that thing. It's great. And uh, I might even talk about that one in a minute too and uh, my newer vehicle as well because well, there's a, some principles there that I'd like to talk about too. And we're going to elaborate on that title, I think, yeah, because, well, okay, so I specialize, yes, I specialize in older vehicles without computers, and, well, that, in a way, goes along with the other comment that was made about, I like simplicity, I like simple things. Well, yeah, because I don't think we need to complicate things as much as we do. Things have got, you know, things have gotten just a little too complicated, and it's not always good. I mean, some things uh, over the years, there have been improvements. There's no question about it. And I'm not anti-technology either, because there's lots of new tech that it's pretty good stuff. But I think we've become a little bit too dependent on it. That's a bit of a problem, I think. The fact that we think we need it, when in fact, uh, no, you don't. Um, perfect example is uh, uh, if you've got a four-wheel drive vehicle, they have this automated system now that will take you and go from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive automatically. It'll kick it in whenever you spin. And they do that through wheel speed sensors and computers and I don't know what. I don't know exactly how it works because that's not my thing. Uh, but I do know that many, many years ago, they did that exact same thing fully mechanically without any electronics whatsoever. And I know because I worked on that particular vehicle and I was amazed at the technology that was in that thing. It had a lot of neat stuff I'm not going to get into, but it was all done mechanically. There was, there was, you could run that thing without a battery and all that stuff would still work. It was that simple. So do I like simple? Yes, I like simple. I love simple. And, you know, because I don't think we need to make things complicated, which is very important in the title. No, and I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, I, I came across, in doing some research, I came across some interesting numbers that uh, were rather shocking. Uh, I wanted to get some comparative ones, the older vehicles and newer ones. I couldn't find anything for the older vehicles. But newer vehicles, the average, now it varies a lot depending on the vehicle you got, but the average new vehicle has got over, what was it, 30,000 parts? And every single one of them can fail. Now, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I do know that the newer vehicles, in fact, have a whole lot more parts than the old ones. That's a fact. And I, I know that because uh, some of the systems that they use in them are basically this similar to the older one, but with twice as many parts to make it work the way they want it to now, because it's changed a little bit. And I'm not going to say it's better. In theory, maybe, but in the real world, no, not better. So, okay, that's the first problem is 30,000 pieces. Now, every single one of those has the potential for failure. So uh, you think you're going to get a more reliable vehicle with a newer vehicle? Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, the fact that it has fewer miles on it, it's not as worn. Uh, yeah, there's potential for it to be more reliable, but it's also a whole lot more complex. Is, like I said, 30,000 parts. Now, some of them, if they fail, it just doesn't matter. Uh, a screw falls out of one of the interior panels. At worst, you might end up with a rattle. Nobody's going to die. But there's a lot of other pieces in that car that can render the car completely inoperative or can get you killed. It can be very darn inconvenient. Yeah. And very expensive. Because the more complexity there is to something, the more knowledge that is necessary in repairing the systems and 
the more expense. And well, that kind of goes with another comment. Is somebody made comment about uh, a good mechanic has to be well rounded. They not only have to understand mechanics, but they also have to understand computers too, because all the new cars got computers in them now. All of them, every single one, has got a computer on it somewhere, some more than one. And in fact, uh, I think there's like sometimes two, three, maybe four or five. I don't know for sure, but it varies. And I know there are multiple computers in some vehicles. That's that's I know that. And it's the, you know somebody said you gotta you gotta keep yourself up to date on all this stuff in order to work on it. And well, that's true. You do. And I am capable of doing that. I don't want to though, because the technology is changing so fast, and so much of it is unnecessary and redundant. It just it doesn't need to be there. Which so I, I don't yeah. I'm not into that stuff. I, I can't be bothered. It takes long enough just to learn how to do one thing good, uh, not ten things. It's just And uh, along those same lines is uh, I knew a guy years ago that worked at a dealership and about one month of every single year uh, he had to go take additional training uh, out of 12 months of the year. One month he spent schooling to update himself for all of the new technology that was in the vehicles that were coming out every year. They kept changing systems and adding stuff and and he needed to know that. And it took him a month of every year to stay on top of that stuff. Uh, the company paid for it. It wasn't out of his pocket, so that was okay there. But it was still, you know, that was just one brand. He worked in a dealership where they that was just one brand that he had to be knowledgeable on. And it required an additional month of schooling every single year just to stay on top of the new stuff that was coming out with one brand. So, yeah, uh, do I want to be on top of all the new systems in all of the different cars? No, I just, it's not worth it. I have enough work to do uh, without that stuff that I don't need to. It's not necessary and it just doesn't make sense to spend a great deal of time educating myself to get good with this stuff so that I can work on stuff that I don't even like and don't think is necessary. Well, that's my opinion, okay? That's not necessarily a fact. But what is a fact is another number that I came up with in my research. Pay attention to this one. You're going to get shocked by this one. I was. Um, I mean, I knew that there was an, a lot of unnecessary technology in vehicles that you pay for that you probably don't need or want. I say probably, because that, again, that's my opinion. But what is a fact is the amount of money that you pay for all that stuff. On uh, the average, and it's again average, it's going to vary a little up and down, but average new vehicle, you are paying $15,000 for all of the computers. That's what you're paying for. $15,000 of the purchase price of a brand new car goes towards the computers. That in my opinion, you don't need. And I'm going to tell you more about that too. And because I've got two vehicles of, that are pretty much opposite extremes. And I think maybe in a minute I'm going to take you out and show them to you. And we're going to talk about those two because, well, they're kind of relevant to what I'm talking about too. But I'm also going to show you another vehicle that proves my point is that uh, the complexity of the newer vehicles and all the technology that's in them and everything can really create problems. So just, hey, I'm going to hop in the car here, go for a ride, and I'm going to show you a truck that uh, I know of. And uh, I'll mention it in the, that segment, uh, but I'm going to say it again now. I don't own it, and it's never been to this shop. But I happen to know about it, and I know just enough about it that it's very relevant to what I'm talking about here. Is you now the complexity of the newer vehicles comes with a price and a problem. So uh, let's go for a ride, and I'll show you that one. Okay, uh, what I have right behind me here is a truck that I actually know very little about, but it's perfectly relevant to the video uh, because, well. Okay, I'll give you a quick backstory. Is uh, I, I I don't own this truck. It's never been to our shop. Okay, so 
let's get that part straight. Uh, but I do know the owners, and as a result, I've learned a little bit about it. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. Enough that it's relevant, okay? And what it is, is uh, this lovely little truck is, it's just a couple years old. It's a fairly new vehicle and fairly low kilometers. Exact kilometers in a year? I don't know. I don't know that stuff. Uh, they bought it a few months ago as a replacement for another vehicle that got totaled off. Not their fault, to make that clear. Uh, they got the thing, they drove it for a couple months and started having problems with it. And, well, they parked it for a little while and eventually they took it into a shop. I don't know which one. It was there for a week. It was there for a week and it came home on a tow truck. That's never a good thing. And uh, it's been sitting here ever since. And it's now been sitting here for, well, well over a month. As you can tell by the length of the grass underneath it, uh, it it's been here for a while. And so uh, basically they have this vehicle worth many thousands of dollars that they can't even use because it hasn't been repaired. Now, as far as I heard it run the other day, so I believe it's, it actually still runs, but there's something, something wrong. I don't even know exactly what, but there's something wrong with it that makes it unusable. And so it's, it sits here. And so they got this, you know, thousands of dollars tied up and in a vehicle that they can't use. And why it didn't get fixed, I don't know if it was, they didn't have a tech that was competent in this particular vehicle or availability of parts. And that's, a, you know, an issue in itself. But either one, uh, the problem is the complexity of a newer vehicle, uh, this one here. And that's, that's the whole problem is we've got a vehicle here that is very complex and has a multitude of parts in it or technology that is difficult to work on and it's hard to find somebody that's actually qualified to do it so uh, there you go I just thought I'd share this one this is real world stuff you know uh, a vehicle a fairly new vehicle that they bought not long ago only got to actually make use of for a very short period of time uh, went to the shop for a week sat there for whatever reason uh, comes home on a tow truck and it's been sitting here for a good month since then and I don't, like I said, I don't know exactly why it's still sitting here. Uh, but either way, whatever the reason, it is going to come down to the complexity of the vehicle that has created the problem, that has rendered this thing basically useless to them, even though they've invested many thousands of dollars into it, which is really sad to see. I don't like seeing that, but that is what it is. So I just thought I'd share this one. This is real world stuff. This is a real story. And you can tell like uh, the length of grass underneath it. It's been sitting here for a while. And uh, nobody in their right mind would uh, have a vehicle this new sitting doing nothing. Unless they didn't have a choice in the matter. Which is exactly what's happened. Now, let's go back to the shop. So we're back in the shop now. And uh, well, we're going to finish what we're talking about. And I'm going to explain the title as well. Uh, if you've stuck with me this long, you deserve to know what that is. Now, uh, K-I-S-S. -S. Well, it's actually an acronym, and it's one that I came across many years ago. And it stands for, and I, I believe, I, I, for, I'm gonna, it goes a long ways back. I don't know where it started or who originally coined the phrase, but I first became aware of it back in, well, late 70s, I think it was, somewhere around there, anyhow, quite a while ago. K-I-S-S -S stands for, keep it simple, stupid. Okay, that's being a little rude when you throw in stupid, but the, the keep it simple principle is something that can be applied to absolutely everything. And, I mean, let's not complicate stuff. Let's not make our solution to a problem more difficult than it needs to be. And I've seen this time and again where people have uh, said, well, I'm going to do something. I want to accomplish this, but I'm going to go about it this way. Well, this way requires 10 steps when, in fact, you could accomplish the same thing with three steps. Um, but 
somehow they think that this is better or easier or I don't know. Keep it simple. You know, whether, whether it's automotive, uh, electrical, uh, anything, gardening, I don't care what you're doing, carpentry. Keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate things. And that's something that is very, very important and should be applied to absolutely everything across the board. I don't care what it is you're doing. Uh, keeping things simple is a very, very important principle that needs to be adhered to. And so when somebody says, I like simple things, well, heck yeah, why not? It makes sense. And it's a principle that we should be adhering to, is keep it simple. You know, it, there's no rhyme nor reason whatsoever for complicating things to the point that we have. You know, uh, particularly in the automotive field, since that's kind of what I'm shooting at here, is I'll share a story I don't know the details of very well, but uh, I read it once. It wasn't 100% relevant other than the basic principle. It didn't surprise me at all. But uh, <clears throat> somebody had a vehicle, and it was new -er. I don't know what year it was. I don't even know what make it was. But they had a problem that basically rendered the vehicle either inoperative or unusable or whatever. And it was uh, to do with the high-tech system. And it turned out that the problem was, in fact, a broken wire. Uh, the kind of thing that you can fix for 50 cents, if you know how. Unfortunately, in the case of this one, uh, the newer vehicles now have got wiring harnesses that might be that big around with 100 wires in them. All very thin wires, and any one of them can break quite easily. It's just a fact. Uh, that kind of stuff can happen. And in the case of his, uh, there was a broken wire somewhere in the harness, but they weren't sure where. Now, unless you were to dissect the entire harness and spend an awful lot of time looking, you're not going to find it. Well, he was quoted uh, somewhere in their neighborhood of $30,000 to repair the problem because it would have required replacing the entire harness. So you'd have the price of the harness plus a ridiculous amount of labor to install the thing because uh, depending on which one it is, uh, some of them are very well concealed, which means taking the car half apart just to get to it. So, I mean, I'm sure that a guy could have uh, worked around it and just run on one wire for that one problem and solved it. But as a result, it was going to cost more to fix it than the vehicle was worth. Now, this is assuming you can even get the harness. Well, that's another problem with the newer vehicles, too, is because of the complexity of them, uh, there's so many parts, and a lot of them seldom fail. Let's and be honest. Uh, some of the parts are pretty good, and they don't fail very often. It doesn't even make sense for a parts supplier to stock all of the parts necessary. Well, like I said, there's 30,000 parts in a new vehicle. Is a parts supplier going to stock all of them? No, not likely. It's not realistic, because some of them, uh, it may be years before they even sell one. So they're not going to stock these things because it doesn't make any sense. They're paying to keep it in inventory. They got their money tied up in the product, plus they got to pay for the storage of it in the building because uh, a building big enough to keep all the parts is going to be ridiculously expensive. If they were to have parts for every brand of vehicle out there of virtually every age, they're going to end up with an, a, just an insane number of parts and a building so big that it's just, they couldn't possibly make enough money to make it, no, it just doesn't make sense. So that's why it's difficult to get parts sometimes is because it's, there's so many now on each vehicle and there's, every year they're different and new and they're always changing and you know not always for the better. And, but these parts, somebody has to stock them, don't they? Well, no, they don't. And that's why they don't anymore. And that's why it's getting more and more difficult to get parts for vehicles all the time because other than the common parts that you can get just about anywhere, like your spark plugs, a starter, a set of tires, brake shoes, things like that, common wear items, uh, anything specialty is going to be expensive and you're going to wait. It's going to take a while to get it because uh, the local parts store doesn't have it in stock. I can guarantee it because it doesn't make sense for them to keep it. They can't have everything there. 
I mean, they're already supplying all the common wear items for vehicles of, you know, the past 30 years or more. Uh, I, even more, actually, because well, I'll get to that later is because I, I got a car that's 58 years old and I can still get parts for it. They still stock them. Yeah, believe it or not. But we'll get to that in a minute. So if you need to get a part and you have a newer vehicle, because of the complexity of it, it's going to be very difficult getting parts. And not because it's not a bad vehicle. Not really. It's just overly complicated and it has way more parts than it needs. They're not common to multiple gears in many cases. And therefore, nobody's going to stock it. You're going to have to order it directly from the manufacturer, assuming it's a vehicle that's still covered by warranty. They're obligated to supply parts as long as the vehicle is still on warranty. Once that warranty is expired, there is no legal obligation to supply parts. So if you have a vehicle that is, you know, I say it has, it comes with a five-year warranty. I'm just throwing numbers out there. I don't know what your vehicle has. They're all different. But say you have a five-year warranty and so many miles, but the mileage, we, we're going to ignore that. Uh, we're going to say you've gone past the five years and now you need a part for your car and you can't get it. Guess what? Nobody out there has a legal obligation to supply that part to you. So, is there any benefit to having a newer vehicle? I don't think so, because uh, we've got several vehicles sitting in our shop here, uh, including my own and customers, that uh, exceed 40, 50, even 60 years, sometimes even more, and we can still get parts for them. Uh, depending on makes and models, uh, some of them are very easy to get parts for. In fact, uh, most of the vehicles that are sitting out here right now are actually easier to get parts for than something that's only two or three years old. Uh, there's actually multiple suppliers of parts for these things. Uh, it's just, and the prices are, well, you might think it's a little steep, but if you look at the price of a new vehicle, uh, what it's going to cost you to fix up an older one versus how much it's going to cost you to buy a newer one, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a minute too. Like I said, I, I'll show you my own vehicles here in a second, and we'll talk about them because there's some interesting phenomena going on that I think we need to address. Some really interesting stuff. So, uh, let's see, uh, what have I covered now? Oh, I know, I'll, I'll get back to this stuff in a minute. But I'm going to take you out and show you my own vehicles and show you the difference between the complicated high-tech system that's supposed to be better and the really, really old school stuff that is supposed to be no good and they don't use anymore. And, uh, well, there's two factors involved in those things. is uh, First, the actual reliability of them and whether or not they really work well. And secondly is the cost because it costs money to have the work done and it costs money for the parts. Which is better, newer or older? I'll let you decide because I'm going to show you a couple of examples and you can make up your own mind. Now, this is a vehicle I've, uh, I've introduced this to you before, but uh, I want to talk about this part of it because, well, it's relevant to this video. See, the little carburetor on this thing here uh, keep in mind, this vehicle is about 58 years old. And uh, I walked into the local parts store, and uh, years ago, it, it's, it's filthy now, it really needs cleaning. But uh, I actually rebuilt this carburetor. But years ago, uh, I wasn't happy with it. It was running okay, but it was leaking a bit. So I thought, well, it's time for a rebuild. Now, it was... Something this old, I mean, I don't know if it's ever been rebuilt before or not, don't know, don't care. Um, in time, a carburetor has to be rebuilt. There are certain diaphragms and such in there that will eventually fail. Now, the problems aren't huge, you know, but there, there's, there's some failure points. And it, you know, I mean, after 20 years or whatever, kind of to be expected, you know, stuff happens. 
So I walk into the parts store and I said, hey, I need a carb kit for this thing. Now, keep in mind, they haven't sold a car with a carburetor on it since uh, <clears throat> uh, early 1980s. Been a while. And yet they had a kit for this thing sitting on the shelf and it only cost me 35 bucks and my time to put it in which was well these are these things are actually pretty easy to work on so it's not a big deal uh, I didn't mind doing it at all I actually did it outside on the tailgate kind of a thing uh, I didn't have a truck but metaphorically a tailgate that actually was the back of my bus whatever I did it outside you know I didn't even do it in a shop or anything I just did it outside and uh, it's been on there ever since, running flawlessly, and it uh, to this day still does. And uh, I think I need to clean it. It looks pretty disgusting. Hmm. Oh well, but that's not important. That's not the part we're talking about. Fact is, a uh, 58-year-old carburetor, carb kit for it, they had it in stock, and it was only $35. And that's Canadian, by the way. If you happen to live in the uh, U.S. where you have a, an O'Reilly's on every corner, that supplies parts. I'm sure you could probably get a kit for one of these things for about 20 bucks. So that's the entire fuel system right there. 20 bucks. Well, okay, 35 for me. But you, know, you get the point. It wasn't a horrible thing and it fixed the entire fuel system for a relatively small amount of money. And uh, to do this car, but I, you know, not to make it uh, sound ridiculous, but even if you don't know what you're doing, you've never done one before. You could probably clean and reassemble this thing in, uh, you know, within two hours. Just, just you know, roughly, within two hours. I could probably do this thing in a half an hour, but it, you could probably do it, even if you don't know what you're doing, you could probably do this thing in two hours. They're, they're not horribly complex. And even though it looks like there's all kinds of fittings on it and, and linkages and everything, um, it's, just, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, you undo that, uh, you snap that thing off, it just clips on the throttle linkage. You unscrew the, the choke and the vacuum vents for the distributor. Undo the pull, two bolts and mount it, off it comes. It's that, that easy. It's very, very simple. And uh, of course the air cleaner which sits on top of this thing is held on with one wing nut. You don't even need a tool for it. And uh, I took it off before I showed it to you because with the air cleaner on, you can't even see the carburetor. But uh, very simple and very inexpensive. Now I'm going to show you my newer vehicle. Okay, now I have a newer vehicle as well. And yeah, it's really dirty under here because I drive on gravel roads and, and things get dirty, okay? Just give me a break. But uh, you, there's an engine under there somewhere. In, by, yeah, I don't know, there's an engine there somewhere. But what I want to talk about is, uh, now, by today's standards, this is an older vehicle. But it's still of the newer generation, or newer, yeah, whatever, newer era, whatever. You know, it's got all kinds of electronics, it's got an EFI on it, it's got a computer in it, it's got all kinds of sensors everywhere. You can see, you know, wires, 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 yeah. It, anyhow. Uh, I was having a problem with this thing, and it was nothing more than the idle speed. Just my idle speed. It was idling too fast, and, well, that is controlled by this part right here. And th this unit here. It's a relatively simple thing, uh, two mounting screws and a plug on the back of it. That's it. It's, it's really simple. It's very easy to change. And uh, most vehicles with EFI have them. And... Well, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, one to waste money and just throw parts on a vehicle. So I actually removed it and cleaned it several times before I finally got fed up and decided, nah, we're going to buy a new one. So I did. I went and bought a new one, which, by the way, works fine. However, that little piece right there, that one single piece that we needed just to make it idle properly. No, not even the mixture, just the speed. That's for the idle speed. It cost $110. I spent over 100 bucks on this vehicle just to make it idle at the right speed. My other one, I could do that by just turning a screw. It wouldn't cost anything. So uh, there's the difference between older and newer stuff. 
This is newer. It's still, like I said, this vehicle would be considered old by many people, but it's still of the newer era where it has all the high-tech gizmos in it. Fortunately, not as many as some. Uh, it's not quite as bad, but it's still got stuff that, like I said, uh, I rebuilt the entire carb on the other one for 35 bucks. Uh, this one cost me 110 just to make the idle, make it idle at the right speed. Because uh, it's not adjustable. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, uh, that's, that's your idle speed control right there. Uh, and it has nothing to do with that thing over there, which is your throttle position sensor. And that's the throttle body up there. And hiding underneath that shroud is the, the lever mechanism for it. And I don't know why they put a shroud over top of it. It just makes it all that much harder to get at everything. Uh, yeah, I've replaced a few parts on this car. I hate it. That kind of sums it up right there. Is uh, keep it simple. We don't need to overcomplicate things. And, and again, I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with technology, but we've become way too dependent on it. There's way too much of it, and it just overcomplicates things, especially in the super new vehicles. They've got some systems in there that just boggle your mind, and and, and I don't keep up to date on them because. Just to know they even exist, you have to be constantly updating your information. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't care it exists. I'm not working on it, so it doesn't matter. I'm not going to touch the stuff. And it's not because I can't, because I've found that uh, one of the problems with modern technicians is there is a lack of troubleshooters. You know, the modern mechanic slash technician, whatever you want to call them, uh, they kind of just do what the computer tells them to do. It says replace a certain sensor or a certain part, whatever, they replace the part. Not realizing the problem is actually a uh, corroded connection, a broken wire, or who knows what, a bad ground somewhere. There's all these things, and uh, very few people out there actually have the skills to troubleshoot that stuff, which is very unfortunate, and I know that problem exists. I've seen it firsthand, and... Uh, well, it's just the way it is, but that's why I think that overall, it doesn't matter what it is, keep it simple. We don't need to complicate things to make them better. Sometimes if we uncomplicate them, we make them better. The simpler things are, the better they are. Well, it's certainly going to cost you less as a consumer to have it worked on, and it's going to make my life a lot better if I don't have to work on something that is way overcomplicated. There's a lot of things out there that, well, a lot of guys have no idea how to work on them anymore. And to me, they're easy. They're relatively simple. But I'm not going to elaborate on that stuff because I could go on for a very long time. Let's just leave it at, let's keep it simple because the complexity of the newer vehicles is entirely unnecessary and it costs you a lot of money and can cost you a lot of inconvenience. As I showed you in the segment of that one truck, uh, they spent tens of thousands on that thing and they can't even drive it because of the complexity of it. That's just, keep it simple. Uh, like I said, I've got a 58 year old car and uh, until just last fall, I parked it last fall because I believe it needs uh, some significant amount of work done to it. Nothing that can't be fixed. It's it's all fixable stuff. And it's certainly going to cost me way less than it would to replace it with anything different. Of any vintage, any mileage, anything. I mean, for what it's going to cost me to put that thing back on the road, I couldn't buy a vehicle that's fit to drive. Guaranteed. So uh, the simplicity of the older vehicles has got its advantages. It can be fixed. You can keep it on the road for a very long time. Don't let the age of a vehicle scare you. And in fact, um, well, unless it's got a lot of the newer tech, but it's still old, that could be scary. But if it's old enough that it doesn't have the new tech in it, that's not very scary. In fact, uh, that's rather comforting to me because that stuff is simple and it's easy to work on. I understand it and it can be kept running for a very, very, very long time. Uh, take your average 10 year old car now, uh, 50 years from now, uh, you probably won't be able to get a part for it. Uh, the cars that I've been working on, they're already 50 years old, and I can get just about any part I want for them. No problem. And so that's the difference between, you know, vehicles of certain eras 
and now they're pretty much all the same and all the same problems. It's just the way it is. So remember, uh, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Well, you don't have to include the stupid part, but keep it simple, okay? That's what this is all about. Keep it simple. It's going to save you a lot of grief in the end. Have a good day.